So, Bertz, you're a Game of Thrones fan. Yes. I'm a Game of Thrones fan. Yeah. The difference between us is that I know more about Game of Thrones than you do because I have played the Game of Thrones video game. The reason we're sitting here right now is so I can talk to you about that video game so you can know everything important in it and that you don't need to play it yourself. I guess my first question would be, is this, is this game more tied into the film or, or the TV show by HBO or is it feel more like in vibe with the books? It's not all of the locations directly from the show. But with that being said, they do have some characters from the show that make an appearance. So like Cersei's there, Varys is there, and Jorah Mormon, the, the old bear at the wall. So what's the setup? You're not playing through the, the TV show or the events of the books or anything like that. It's kind of a side story, right? Right. It starts a little bit before the first book starts. So John Aaron is still alive at the outset of the game. The big climactic scene of the game takes place in the throne room while like every while the whole city of King's Landing is off watching Ned Stark get, get his head cut off. Tywin Lannister gave the order to Moors to go and kill um, Princess Elia and her kids, like Rhaegar's wife okay. and, and Rhaegar's kids. That was the baby that was smashed against the wall, right? Right, yeah. right. Tywin gave Moors this order and Moors refused it. So then Gregor Clegane went and like did the dirty work. But because of that, and th these are all of the sort of like late revelations. game revelations yeah. that you're getting is that because he didn't do that, um, Tywin then ordered Alistair, who was like Moors' good buddy back then, to go and like kill Moors' wife and family after Moors took the black and went to the wall as sort of a, you know, you don't refuse an order from Tywin Lannister kind of, kind of thing. So Alistair and his bastard half-brother, who is trying to marry his si who is now trying to marry his sister, like back in, you know, 15 years in the past or whatever, they went and killed Moors' family. This comes to light at the very, very end of the game. Like, you kill your half-brother, and he does the, like, oh, so you never told him, did you, Alistair? <laughs> <laughs> she was so... So, like, we know that Martin is dark in his writing. To a point, that's good. In the novels, that's how you know that, like, no one is safe. Yeah. There's a difference between that and a more sadistic approach of, like, trying to seek out ways to harm characters. The Targaryen woman that you've spent the whole game protecting has her baby. She dies. She sacrifices herself. Alistair's sister, who he's, you know, trying to You'll rule safe, his yeah. hometown with. Oh yeah, she just gets her head chopped off. She just gets know, Nothing ever goes right you. for these characters. All the way up to the very end. I mean, it's really a sort of grim setup for the final battle, where it's like two best friends who have to kill each other because one of them has just done something horrible to the other and lied to him about it for years. Each of whom has already lost everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like like none of them have anything, anything more to lose. So that, so they're just like killing the last friend they have. <laughs> and then after that, all of the endings that spring from those choices are just depressing. And one of them, like Alistair kills Moors and then ends up giving the, the child to Cersei as a sort of show of good faith. To be like, look, hey, can I have my, can I have my house back now? Because I, di I did what you wanted. And she's like, yeah, okay. So then you're lord of this, of Riverspring, like you always wanted, except you hate being a lord and all these people want stupid things from you. And it just ends, the final shot of him is him like looking at the fire with like a noose in the background. And he's just gonna hang himself. <laughs> the end. So, so what's the takeaway for a, for a fan of the series? Like, is there anything that you really felt like, oh, they colored something new that I did not know about this world. Not really. I mean, like, like there's, there's nothing that's, that's brand new. I will say, like, I do like the sequences up at the wall. I mean, I think the, it's, the wall is a, it doesn't look exactly like it looks in the show, for instance, but like that area, I've always sort of liked the sort of like stark cold, the sort of wild, like the forest and stuff around in that area. Like, I liked being able to sort of delve into that stuff a little bit more. Exploring this vision of those locations is really sort of the highlight. And the stuff with Alistair as a red priest is cool. Like the powers, like the powers that he has in combat and stuff, like are kind of awesome. You set your sword on fire and make people explode. And like, like the actual powers in combat 
can can be kind of fun, but you know the game mishandles so many things on like technical and design levels that it's yeah. that it's really just like that it's really not worth not worth playing. The big takeaway for fans is that like you know it's it's cool that that you get this other plot that Varys had going about you know another successor that he's sort of planning to get uh, across the narrow sea. It kind of solidifies his place as not just like playing all the sides, but he's definitely playing the Targaryen side. Right. It seems right. like. Well, and except you know that if the Targaryens don't succeed, like who knows what he's really playing? You know, if if yeah. all those plans fall through, who knows what other contingencies he has going on too? You still get you still get that sense about him, the sort of like he's got a lot of spinning plates. Yeah, exactly. I kind of like the way too that it hammers home the the relationship of like lords and bannermen and their like loyalty to the crown and stuff like that you you get a sense of the kind of like you know even as a lord you're still sort of subject to royal whims Mm -hmm. but you still sort of there's also a sense of like you having control over your your hometown and like its citizens depending on you and stuff like that so the way that it sort of fleshes out that aspect of the world i thought was cool. Did they do any environmental storytelling, like clever nods to the books or the TV shows that you kind of get along the way? I know there's one in particular that yeah. kind of sticks out. Yeah, the big, the, the big one, the big one that's a nod for uh, fans. Uh, well, I, mean, I guess I w- was going to say books, but I guess an- anyone who's familiar with it, uh, there's a maester who looks exactly like George R. R. Martin. You'll know him because he's the only person in the whole game who wears glasses. And he's just missing his naval cap, right? Otherwise, he's like... Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it, it looks just like him. He's got the glasses. He's just not wearing, like, the hat that he always wears. And Otherwise, they trimmed him down a little bit, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but then the other thing that's funny about that is there are a few, like, fourth wall breaking things that, you know, teeter between interesting and funny to just straight up lame. So it's like, hey, Maester Martin... Uh, are you working on that history of the of the Seven Kingdoms? Oh yes, I've been working on it every day. Like, oh, when's it gonna be done? Oh, I told you it'll be done next year. Oh, he says that every year. Oh know? God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, we do not live in a fantasy story. So you can just sort of save yeah. those save those twenty five hours or so and put it towards a game that's more fun. Max Payne 3, here I come, I guess.